Remember, we talked a little bit in our last session about how Nimrod played a role in Pergamon. Nimrod played a role in this place, too. Simeon was a goddess and was worshipped as a goddess, and that was Nimrod's consort, in which they parented Tumez. You remember reading about Tumez, the sun god? And this stuff goes way back. So this place had an ancient history of right after men got off the boat, Nimrod began to take over. Some connotations that Nimrod lived 500 years. Definitely a giant, a Nephilim. I, I found a carving of him in here, believe it or not. I'm, I'm going to show you that. It's going to uh, pop your eyes out. Some of the old structures, some of the new structures around fresh springs that they have there, some of the ruins. So let's begin by reading our scripture. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, the Son of God. You realize he's giving not only one of his titles, but he's making a declaration that he's God. Why would he have to make a declaration that he was God here in this city? Because something has gone on in times past, which we'll, we'll get to that. In, in other translations, it says, I'm the Son of God standing here. Why aren't you looking at me? <laughs> Who has eyes like flames of fire and feet that are like burning, burnished bronze. And I say this, I know your deeds. I also know your love and your faith and your servants and your perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. What are the deeds of late? Service and perseverance. How did they begin? In faith and in love. And he's making a statement to them, your love and your faith, something wrong here with that. I do know that you have some. But your deeds that you did at first, uh, those were the ones that are important. But now you put these, you put service and perseverance. Now it takes all four for us to have a good foundation. It takes all four. And so in their deeds, they had gone to service and perseverance. And I can tell you, if love is not there and faith is not there very much, there's very little service. That's why there's very little service in the body to one another. The more love that there is and more relationship that there is, and it just, it just makes my heart leap. Last night, I you know, worked hard all day, and I think we finally quit, I don't know, 7 or 8 o'clock last night, something like that, and been working every day like that. And uh, I don't know, something was just longing in me. I don't know what it was. Sat down to watch something... Uh, you know, some cartoon movie or something. Uh, I, I, I'm not real hip on cartoon movies. <laughs> and and a, a great sadness settled over me. And I don't remember what... Oh, we ended up watching something else. Oh, Christmas. <clears throat> Christmas tree special. <clears throat> I'm a venture guy. So... I must say it was good and it got my attention. But my soul wasn't satisfied. My soul was needing something and I didn't know what it was. I was praying, Lord, what does my soul need besides what I think it needs, which is rest and relaxation, which somehow I can't get my head there. How do I get there? You know, you, you remember the pressure cooker. <laughs> How do I get there? <laughs> and lo and behold... I hear a knock up on the door. It's dark, and I'm wondering, there's someone knocking on the door. There, there's someone actually knocking on... And you don't get to say that very long because the dogs explode. <coughs> we have exploding dogs. <coughs> and lo and behold, the door opens, 
and my soul just absolutely limped. God sent what I needed. I needed a visitation from someone I love and someone I care for, from someone that's a part of me and someone that's in the body. I didn't even know it. And man, I was just ecstatic, head over heels of, oh, you know, I wanted to kidnap them and not let them go home, you know. I brought us some beans and some peaches from Diane's and and we hopped up for a little while and showed them the wonderful destruction and all that stuff. But that was okay. I'm standing beside somebody and look at the, look at it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the thing is, is that Jesus knows you inside, and if you're not in love with one another, if you're not in love with Him, there's going to be less of it showing in you to one another. And then we get into real weak service and perseverance. So that's why He makes the statement, I know that your deeds of late are greater than at first. So let's go on here. We have... I'm missing a passage, the scripture 18, 19, I'm missing 20. Twenty is about Jezebel, I think. Yeah. Where, where he, he basically, I don't have it before me, he, he says, uh, I have this against you, you tolerate that prophetess Jezebel. And then he says in verse 20, he says 21, I, is that all 20 says? And he, no, Jackie? You I have to speak up. Here. I can't see it. I don't have glasses. You get to read it. To teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> she introduces his servants to immorality and things given to idols. Which brings us back to a case study about the city. Because this is a very special city and they had one, two, two unique products, the most unique was the purple dye. They had developed a strong trade union that would not let their trade secrets out. And if you wanted to have any enterprise at all in that city, you had to belong to their trade union. And if you wanted to belong to the trade union, you had to go down and join them for their dinners. And their dinners were held at their God's temples. And then they would offer thanks for the meat to their gods, offer a sacrifice to their gods, and then they would fix you a flaming T-bone stick. Then afterwards, there would be wild orgies that if you didn't participate in, they didn't think that you were a really trustworthy memory, a member of the guild, and therefore they might not trade with you and put you on not on the wholesale list I'll put it that way because you got to be a handler they they were a real tight society about their finances about the color purple it was a really unique thing in the world no place else in the world was this developed and so this woman she had become a part of the church and she was telling the people in the church and saying, I'm a Christian, and having the gift of prophecy, and under the influence of her so-called gift of prophecy, oh, the Lord says, well, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's just meat, and, you know, we, we can't, our, our society is, it's, it's that away. And besides that, you might be able to get somebody saved while you were there. That sound like today? Our church is turned to, we watched a little segment the other night, and it was like a rock concert, trying to get kids all enthused and all that stuff. And even the guy that was about my age is wearing teenage clothes and hairdo and chatting them up on their level and all that stuff. 
I see in the last days, the scripture says that the church will go cold, one, and two, that it will become a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. Well, I don't know if you know this or not, all the pleasures that we want to chase and seek are attached to different gods. Did you know that? They're, they're idols, is what they're called. Even, even money is called magog, it's called an idol, money is. And it doesn't matter if it's Chinese, Japanese, American money. It doesn't matter if it's paper. It doesn't matter if it's from Mexico. It doesn't matter if it's gold or if it's just diamonds. It's cashola. It's the having the panache. It's having, the, having riches. That's, that's the god of Magog. And our society specializes in, pardon? Mammon. Thank you. Thank you. And our, our society specializes in the worship of things attached to mammon, which has to do with the God, which also goes all the way back to uh, the Babylonian Empire. And when I say Babylonian Empire, this is pre-Babylonian Empire. You realize all religion that was come to the world came through Nimrod. I don't know if you know that or not. Nimrod's consort, this place was named after Nimrod's consort. And uh, so, because she's doing this in the midst of the church, she looks like a Christian, she acts like a Christian, but she says, it's okay, y'all just y'all cl close your eyes, just leave early, enjoy your T-bone steak, be a part, get your business up, blossoming and blooming, and you know, we've got to get your kids in there too, and get them trained up, and get them through all, because you, you went through all this secret society, handshakes and stuff, and uh, it's, uh, it's said to even have some attachment to the uh, Masons, believe it or not, and uh, Masons go all, all the way back, there's indications in history that started with Nimrod, and him building the Tower of Babel, did you know that? I know they want to tie it in to Solomon's temple. No, no. <laughs> History has it that it has something to do with Nimrod and the building of the tower. Uh-oh, something problem there. So, we go on here. Because she's doing that and she's inducing God's children to say it's okay to look upon and do these things, it's okay, and God even understands. He's, he's an understanding God. He's a merciful God. He's a loving God. He's a forgiving God. Jesus has this to say, and there's, a, there's, there's two things here. The words that are used from about the uh, immorality that is talked about in verse 20, which I don't have on the screen here, uh, the immorality there is also used most of the time in the New Testament, Old Testament, for spiritual immorality, for being involved in adultery with other gods, for being involved in fornication with other idols. Most of the time, that word is used in that sense. And obviously, since he's taken time to name the woman, obviously her name would not have been Jezebel. But he's identified a key player in the Old Testament. That's also a key player in the New Testament, and it's Jezebel. Jezebel wanted to replace, Elijah was on the scene at the time, Jezebel married the king there of Israel, and she was an outlander. And she said, well, hey, uh, how about I bring my God in here, and I'll bring a few prophets. And she was like the high priest of a whole other order and society of worshiping another god. Two different counts in the Bible. Some say that she had 400 prophets. Others say she had 450. Well, there are two different statements in there. She had 450 doing one thing, and she had 400 doing another thing. That's 850 prophets that worship this other god. Now you ask, well, what difference does that make? What she was introducing Israel to was, oh, it's okay, yeah, go down to the temple and offer your thing, and we'll put two mez in there, and we'll do these other things, and we can worship these, these other gods too. That, that's fine. You know, we're, we're all peaceful. We all need to get along. No, we don't. And what began to take place was God's wrath was against Israel 
because of Jezebel introducing that into Israel, into the people. And the king totally failed because the king, God's the one that set up kingship there in Israel. A king was supposed to be a protector of God's word, making sure the people obeyed God. That was his position, to be the authority that if they didn't want to obey God, they were to be die or leave the country. Why? Because it was God's land. It was God's country. It was God's... It was God. So, something from the enemy, from Satan, it's the spirit of Jezebel, crept into Israel and corrupted it so much that God lifted up a man of God to begin to deal with that. Of course, we know Elijah called down fire and all these things, but this woman, was a, she ruled the nation through her husband, the king. And he was a real weenie that would lay down to anything. He was afraid of everything. And she said, oh, hey, you're the king. I'll, I'll take care of these. Take care of your enemies. No problem. She was a murderess. She didn't mind murdering people, having them murdered. And so when the, Jesus makes the statement, he's using this icon from the Old Testament. Now, you do realize there's over 400 references in the book of Revelation that bring forward 800 prophecies and 800 things that took place in the Old Testament. 400 take place in this single book. It says, bring these things in, bring these things in. So the second he, the player, the key player, Jezebel, but put on the, the, put on the table, it's an attack from the enemy to divert God's people from serving God and excommunicating God because she made it her task to try to kill all the prophets of Yahweh that were in the land. That was her objective, kill all the prophets. She had a vendetta, and she wanted to vindicate and vanquish the land of this God that had cost these people so much. And I meet many people today say, God's cost people all this stuff, you know. Where's he at? I'd like to deal with him. She was that away. As a matter of fact, she was after Elijah trying to kill him. And of course, we know that she died, and I'm not going to go into the complete story. But because of her wanting to do that to people, God's people, Jesus makes the this, makes this statement, I gave her time to repent. What is he saying? I don't need you to make a decision whether she needs to repent or not. And I don't need you to even be praying for her. I don't need you to be giving her mercy. I don't need you to be giving her grace. I don't need you to be having anything. I'm the one that gave her time to repent, and she didn't repent to me. Often we want to continue to give mercy to someone who wants to destroy the church. It is their intent to destroy the church. He says he already took care of that, and she doesn't want to repent of her spiritual immorality, and it could be even sexual immorality. And then he makes the statement of his judgment that's irreversible. It cannot change, it does not change, and it will not change. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and throw those who commit spiritual and physical adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds unless they repent. So those that have been in leagues with her, of bashing the church, of resisting God, of saying it's okay to be part of the world, okay to go watch this movie. I, you know, I tried to watch a little cartoon movie with my granddaughter a couple of nights ago, and it looked real innocent and cutesy and all this stuff, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm not even going to describe to you the clothes they started wearing. I mean, if it, was, if it would, had been physical people, it would have been an X-rated movie just because of the clothes that they were wearing and the suggestions and the provocativeness of it, the sexual for children. It was being presented to them. But that's okay. It's a cartoon. They can't PG-13 those or X those because it's a cartoon. Boy, I'm telling you, they need to do more than that. Behold, I'll throw her into a bed of sickness. I find that interesting. He's going to throw her into a bed of sickness instead of just killing her. First Jezebel, he had her killed. Which is worth just to die or to have a sickness that just lingers and lingers and lingers and lingers and lingers and lingers. And it won't go away. It won't go away. It won't go away. And not only that, but your kids. It goes, it gets on them. Maybe not the same sickness, 
Every sickness, visit upon your children. It won't go away. It keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And I'm thinking, well, wow, Lord, that's a pretty serious judgment. But he's also saying, I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Jesus, as the Son of God, is standing there making a judgment and saying, Satan is not the only one that can bring sickness. I want you to know if you diddle with my church and you bring injury to it, I'll bring this upon you and I'll make sure your children are dead with pestilence. You realize Jesus is saying that. And the reason I'm bringing it on so strong is because the Mamby Pamby church of today said, oh, Jesus is just a God of love and he, he wouldn't hurt anybody. He, he, he wouldn't. I got news. His enemies are his enemies and they are going to be the worst tortured people that ever existed in this universe. They're cast into a torture pit. Why? Because they're corrupting his universe and they're worse than cancer. What, 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 do, you, what do you do with cancer? You, 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 you irradiate it. You, you try to kill it. Our deviation from the instructions of God and our relationship and functionality with Him it's ten times worse than what cancer is. God looks at it that we were this creature that could have communed with Him and something is eating us where we can't. And He hates that, what is eating us. And He makes war against that, what is eating us. And shouldn't He? Because if He makes war and He wins, then whatever little part of me didn't get eaten by cancer gets to be with Him. But meanwhile, if I'm hanging on to that cancer and feeding that cancer, it gets tough for me. But he's still trying to rescue me, and he's trying to save me. So he makes a declaration here. And the reason he does is because it's connected to some of the things that Nimrod did after man got off the boat. They started building the tower about 200 years after man got off the boat. Just 200 years Someone showed up on the scenes, but let's go on. We'll catch the rest of that. He said, but I say to you and the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching. Ah. If you receive something and you don't fight against it, you're a holder of it. If somebody spills coffee on you, you're still a holder of the coffee. Church is supposed to stay clean before the Lord. The church is supposed to be pure before the Lord and purified. And they're supposed to identify the spirit of Jezebel that wants to say, it's okay to walk in the world. It's okay to be a part of the world. They're supposed, we're supposed to identify that. And, and, and when someone says that, no, no, that's not a good movie to see. That, that would insult God. No, you can't do that. And call yourself a Christian? That's not of God. You need to pray about that. Not in a condemning way, nor in a controlling way. Because if God won't violate someone's free will, neither should we. We should be pleading for the fact that when we want to do something in error that will cost us something in a relationship with the Lord, that someone would in the church would approach us and say, Oh, brother, sister... You know, you, you, I, I heard you were watching this TV series, and it's got this and it and this and it, and it's going to corrupt your mind and your heart. Now, don't do that if you're a person that just likes to give people a piece of your mind. <laughs> Giving someone piece of your mind is not peace. That's you getting to say some poignant, sharp words, and if you're given to like giving sharp words to people, don't bother. This is not your assignment. Instead, report it to the pastor. The pastor is supposed to be watching everybody in the field. The sheep are grazing, and if there's a snake down in the far corner of the pasture, the shepherd's supposed to know about it. I find it interesting. I, we lived on a sheep farm one time, had a thousand head of sheep there. And, uh, you know, the, the sheep didn't want to tell on each other. Oh, you stepped in the mud there, Fred. <laughs> Master, I'm, I'm not going to tell the master. And, and, and you know, and Fred, no, don't tell the master I stepped in the mud. Don't tell him I'm down here rolling in it. Don't tell him I'm slipping under the fence. Don't tell him, don't tell him. And all it does is endanger other sheep. You know, poor little Fred is going to have some real problems, especially we lived in Montrose, Colorado when I was a kid, and, you know, 20 below zero. And if a sheep is down in the water, he can freeze to death. He can get hypothermia. 
It's not as though he, he can he can withstand that easy if he's if he's not in the water. Now he goes on to make this statement. But I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to these teachings, who have not known the deep things of Satan. Wow! All of a sudden, he's associated the things that Jezebel did of saying it's okay to worship other gods. He's associating these things with the deep things of Satan. The deep things of Satan are so subtle. They're so subtle. Uh, Morgan, would you come up here and sit next to Jackie, please? The deep things of Satan are so subtle that you will not even see him when he comes. He's going to entice you to release your anger. He's going to entice you to justify you shortcutting the fences. You know, if I'm in a grocery line and a checker checks me out and uh, misses the item there and, and says, oh, well, I don't want to have to re-ring it. Well, she just stole something from the store and I'm not going to take it home. I don't care if it's 25 cents. She's going to ring it up. And if it's a $40 item, she's sure going to ring it up. And I'm not going to come to you and say, well, God bless me with an extra ham from church because they didn't charge me for it. No. That's the deep things of Satan creeping in that we're willing to compromise, that we're willing to go astray. Now keep in mind, what is offered here? Jesus is saying, I'm standing here, and I'm the Son of God, and my eyes are like fire, and my feet are like brass. He's saying, I'm seeing plumb through you. There's nothing in you that's not hidden. And all of that, my feet are judging Everything. Brass represents judgment. They're judging everything that goes on in your life. And Jesus comes and stands in our midst. That's why we need the power of the Spirit. The Spirit enables us so that we could cry out for the blood of Jesus to cover us and His forgiveness. For when Jesus comes, we can repent of those little things that keep us from being in His presence. Jesus is trying to get this church back into a position where they can see Him and they can hear Him, they can walk with Him, and they can fellowship with him evidently they forfeited that now he didn't make the threat to them that he was going to remove their candlestick remember he made the threat to the first church and the seventh church if you don't correct this thing i'm going to remove your lampstand from my presence now there are many churches that jesus has removed the lampstand from his presence he no longer associates with them they're pseudo churches he no longer walks there, nor talks there, nor goes there. The reason being is because they don't want him. There are people that can come into our midst that will try to stir up something within us to get us to the point that we want something else other than our Lord Jesus. With intent. With intent. That we want something else. And then he goes on and he makes the statement, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. There's no indication that he's talking about the second coming. coming. A whole indication is, is that they were a church that were seeing him. They were a church that received his visitations on a regular basis, that they were all conscious of seeing and hearing and walking and talking with him. And he's saying, get this fixed until I come. Hold on to what you have until I come. Get the Jezebel out from your midst until I come. Get these things fixed. And that has to do with the service, and has to do with perseverance, and has to do with the love. Now, then he makes this statement. He who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end. Remember, Jesus started off saying, I know your deeds. Now he's saying, I want you to keep my deeds. Because there's many things that we do thinking that these deeds are going to somehow help us in God's eyes. I made the statement the other day that Bill Gates is a great philanthropist. You know, he gives away billions of dollars to help people. Do you think that's going to be mentioned in front of one angel in heaven? Where's one church that he helped? Where's one person in the kingdom of God that he helped? Where's the kingdom of God that he's helped? Do you realize the guy's got enough money that he could build 10,000 new churches and not even blink 
and still have enough cash to last him to do anything he wanted, including going to Mars. He's not done anything for the kingdom of God. Now, this is not racked down on Bill Gates' day. It's getting to the point in our mindset that good works out there in the world of just giving stuff away is going to get us in heaven. It's not. Instead, we're supposed to be doing God's deeds. You're not going to find that out unless you're planted in a church. You're not going to find that out unless you have a shepherd to teach you. You're not going to find that out unless you learn how to walk in the Spirit, get baptized in the Spirit, fill with the Spirit, and begin to be transformed in your nature and in your character so that Jesus' presence will come and you can sense it. Now, Jesus is standing there saying these things, and they can't sense it and they can't see it. They can't understand it. So Jesus gives instructions to an angel to pin it down and instructions to John and then, then sends it to an angel <laughs> there in Thyatira for it to be delivered. And of course, John's letter comes a little bit later, but the angel received it first. He's saying, you keep my deeds until the end. Now, to him I will give authority over the nations. Wow, why would he make that statement? Why would he make that statement? And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of the potter are broken into pieces. What does he mean by that? Boy, those are things that tie back to Nimrod. With the exception of the pottery. For that was the second craft that this place had. There's still a huge pottery factory there. And they make some of the world's best pottery and they have someone in charge of the pottery factory, several people, and those people go by and inspect what the other people have made, and they carry a rod of iron, and if it doesn't live up to the standards of what the factory wants to send out, because they want to only send out the perfect stuff, they'll look at the person and then take the rod of iron and bash it and break it. Why? Because they only want perfection to be sent out of their factory, so that they can keep their reputation. Now, the other thing, he says, to him I will give authority over the nations. And that goes all the way back to Nimrod. You remember Nimrod got off the boat? He was the first rebel against God. I mean, true rebel. He said, I, I will also, uh, let's back up here. He overcomes, he, uh, and, he, and he who keeps my deeds until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations, and to him... He shall rule them with the rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken into pieces. As I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him that overcomes the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, there's a couple of things. I'm going to try to tie those together for you. The morning star is the only star that shines when the sun is out. If you go out, right now the sun's still in the sky. You can't see a star one. If the morning star was up, you would see it even though the, star, the sun is shining. What that means is most of the glory that most of us will experience in life is all about Jesus. He's this brilliant thing in our lives. But if we do what he says and attend his deeds, there's this brilliance of his glory that begins to come over us. If we take on the nature and the character of Jesus Christ and learn how to walk in the Spirit, his brilliance and his light comes upon us so much that even if Jesus was standing there, his glory that he's placed within you, it would still glow. Now, I find that so significant that he offers us a place in his kingdom that we not admit our own light. We are emitting the light that he has given us. But it's still us. He's saying, if you overcome, you can become that. That when I come and stand and everybody sees my glory, people will look and see you like the morning star standing next to me. I desire that so much. I struggle for that. I work for that. Not for the glory, but to know Him. Because the more I know Him, the more I hear Him, the more I'm trained by Him, the more I walk with Him, the more revelation He gives me, and the more I can carry out in service to Him, 
the more I become this morning star. This is one of Jesus' promises. And of course, he's talking to a church that has lost the ability to hear him and see him in person. So he makes the statement, hey, I know you're spirit-filled, and if you still can pray in the spirit and hear in the spirit, if you have any ears, and any of us have ears, let him hear what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is trying to relay to, the, to us that if we will do his deeds, get Jezebel out of our midst, tend our first love, remember Ephesus lost their first love, don't become like the church that had the throne of Satan there, make sure to clear that out of the way. But Jezebel is one of the biggest things I've seen in the church hit. Yeah, there are attacks that occur from Satan, but most of the attacks that really occur from Jezebels within the church. I've seen more Jezebels destroy huge churches and especially small churches. They always come seeking and saying, I'll serve, I'll love, I'll do anything, I'll be submissive, yakety yak yak, and if you give them any form of position, they begin to undermine, they begin to tie in to others. It is a form that of demonic spirit that somehow can rule and bring destruction. It's, that's its purpose. That's its purpose. I recently had lunch with a pastor, and the pastor uh, did something that was inappropriate, not to anyone, and then he confessed that before the church, and the church forgave him, and he took a sabbatical, and then uh, you know, he went through counseling and went through correction and all that stuff with his denomination. And uh, th this, uh, this lady didn't like the way it was done. But before that, that happened, she wanted to take the pulpit and begin to give prophecy out of the pulpit. And he said, you know, that's not my call. The elders of this church are the ones that rule that. This is an elder-ruled church. That, uh, it was a denomination where elders rule the church, not, not men of God. And uh, he, uh, he told her, he said, I, I'm, and, and he trusted her. Matter of fact, this, this lady played an important role in telling everybody about prophecy and all this church. This, was in a, this is an evangelical church. And this guy had got the church to begin to believe in things of the Spirit. And that went on for about five to seven years. And then when this lady couldn't take the pulpit in position to give her own prophecies, she put him in the dumper and reported that the elders did everything wrong. And there's been an internal suit going on for two years that this lady is trying to cause, all because she was refused the position of being able to speak, thus saith the Lord, to these people. Her whole actions are one of destruction to that church and now destruction to the denomination. Now, my purpose in bringing these things up is because in, Satan always does the same thing over and over and over. That's why we need to be careful with our words and what we say. Spirit of Jezebel, obviously, anybody can be used by that spirit. If you have the right personality and you have a vendetta, then this spirit will show up to help you reinforce your vendetta. Now, let's go on here. Remember, we talked a little bit about Nimrod. Nimrod, that's a carving of him, or Gilgamesh, which are the same. He's got a lion tucked under his arm, a full-grown lion tucked under his arm. Nimrod was a giant, he hated God. He hated God with a passion. And when he got off, he didn't get off the boat. He was the grandson of, great-grandson of Noah. Cush was his father. And I read a lot, and I found out there was another son that Noah had had, and that son somehow knew about, read about, or found things from the old world that God had washed away. Remember how the world was infested with demonic forces and the crossover, the Nephilim, and all that stuff? He allegedly taught this man 
which was a giant, the incantations from the old world. And this Gilmesh, or Nimrod, he's the one that turned all the hearts of mankind against the Lord God. And in fact, there are several epics that have been found of his deeds written in clay tablets. The clay tablets date back 2000 B.C., but they indicate that they go back another 2,000 years before that. Nimrod epic describes the first God is dead movement. In the epic, the hero is a vile, filthy, perverted person, yet he is presented as the greatest, strongest hero that ever lived. There's your source if you want to go look that up. So that the one who sent the flood would not trouble them anymore. Gelmesh, or Nimrod, sets out to kill the perpetrator. He takes with him a friend who is a monstrous half-man, half-animal, in Kikadu, a demonic force, if you go look that up. Together they go on a long journey to the Cedar Mountain to find and destroy the monster who sent the flood. Gilmish, or Nimrod, finds him and finally succeeds in cutting off his head of this creature whose name is Hawai, Yahweh, <laughs> Humbaba and Assyrian. And there's your reference if you want to look up that. Uh, note that Gilmesh says to Enkidu, the half-man, half-beast, who accompanied it on his journey. This was found in the tablet in line 147 through 50. If I fall, Gilmesh says, I will establish a name for myself. Gilmesh is fallen, and they shall say, in combat with the terrible Yahweh. Genesis 10.9 gives us a portion of some missing lines. There's five lines missing out of these clay tablets. Of the, uh, the, those lines included, it is said, Nimrod, or Gilmesh, the mighty vanquisher of Yahweh. You, you realize what vanquisher means? That means get him off the face of the earth, get him out of our way. This has to be what is missing from the clay tablets of Gilmesh, Nimrod's story. The Gilmesh Nimrod epic calls him Yahweh and the or Hawway and the Bible calls him Yahweh. In Genesis ten nine, we just got through reading that, it really reflects that Nimrod. Now Nimrod, remember Semiram, that was his consort. She was worshipped as a goddess, he was worshipped as a god, and he made everyone left on the face of the earth after the flood, denounced God. And he made the pronouncement, I have gone and killed him. I went and cut his head off. And there was a direct intention of him to replace God and make himself God. And his consort, Semeron, a goddess. And what was the name of the city? Thyatira, daughter of. And what was the previous name of the city? Semeron. And since Nimrod is the one that's saying, I went and cut his head off, do you get the line about Jesus saying, I will be the ruler over the nations? I will. Why? Because that's what Nimrod said. I will be the ruler over the nations. And he also said, I cut his head off. And Jesus says, I'm the son of God. You didn't cut my head off. I'm the son of God. And it says he's going to dash him with a rod of iron. So that conflict, that spiritual conflict of who's really in charge is behind the scenes here. Showing us again that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness and high places. There is a passage of scripture. Uh, it's Psalms, and I don't know what I did with it. Psalms 2, because if you go and look at the history, Nimrod got all the people of the earth. God came, they built the tower. He lived, some reports, 500 years. God came down and disrupted the languages and the people dispersed. He could speak to different languages. 
Why? Because he would take the different people and he started several other towns. Ramoth, Nineveh. And this is one of the places that some of his priests came. Remember when Cyrus took over? Cyrus the Great that returned Israel back to Israel? All the priests of Nimrod, Gelrath, Gilgamesh, all those priests of Semiram fled and went to Pergamon and this city. This place was the recovery site for those demonic forces that were once so strong. But the spirit of Jezebel rose up in the midst of Israel, coming and worshiping the same gods. Matter of fact, when Nimrod brought forth Tumaz and himself as a god and Sumerian as a god, all the gods that sprang after after that, he went and started these different civilizations and are even the point of him being attached to the Grecian. He is the one that also appointed the different gods for those, but they're all the same gods, but they were in their new languages. I showed you a picture of him, but let's see what it, why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain. It actually says that he conspired and he went out and he told all the people, this God that killed our forefathers, the great men of this earth, I am going to go kill him myself. They bought it. The whole earth bought that. Let us, and, and, and so Psalms is written, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? And the kings of earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs and the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. And I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. And what is Jesus saying? I am the son of God. Why? Because this is the place that that spirit had come. Even from Israel, the spirit of Jezebel originated from here, coming all the way from Nimrod back not many years after they got off the boat. Then he goes on to say, Today I have become your father, ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the end of the earth your possession, and you will rule them with an iron scepter, and you will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, kings, be wise. He warned you rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling and kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and destroy you in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Do you see the connection with what he's saying in Thyatira? Why? Because he was dealing with the residue of that spirit that was resident in this place. Remember, we learned about Pergamon, that the throne of Satan was there in Pergamon. We learned about this place. They took second place. But even so, Jesus shows up and he puts all the remedy on the table for dealing with the residue of Nimrod on the face of the earth. All the different religions of the world came through Nimrod. It's just a repeat of the same gods, Tumaz, Semiramian, and Nimrod. Here Jesus says, I'll give you authority. And when he's talking about authority, he's talking about authority over them, over those forces, over the forces that will keep us from his presence, over the forces that want to drive us away from Jesus, over the forces that would lie to us and say it's okay to be impure people before the living God. Jesus just got through saying, take this to heart, live it, and begin to do the deeds that I want you to do, and if you do, I'll make you like the morning star. So he's made another declaration and another promise that he will fulfill within your lifetime if you will serve him and do what he says. So we bow our hearts before the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word and we ask you just to invade our lives, Lord, and bring it into reality of the spiritual fight. Our world has lost the understanding of the spiritual battle, Lord. And you said that's where the fight's at. It's not against flesh and blood. 
You taught these people to begin to pray and fight against those forces of darkness that were affecting them and their church and causing it to lose your presence or lose a conscious mind of your presence. You came for them and rescued them and showed them a way they could enter into your presence again. Lord, we're church too. And we constantly need your tending, your care, and your tender mercies. We need you to reveal the schemes of the enemy, for they are beyond us. So give us spiritual insight and understanding and application to our own lives of not to justify anything before you, but instead be, obey, be obedient to you and let you justify us. Teach us to walk in humility, to your heart and follow your instructions. How we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Mm -hmm.